We're going to be looking at uh, uh, the book of Daniel and the fifth chapter. The book of Daniel and the fifth chapter. I had a, a realization uh, last night at about, uh, I don't know, seven o'clock, eight o'clock maybe. Uh, one, that I need to put my clocks forward. I'm like, oh man, I lose an hour. But no, the bigger realization was as I looked at my mirror, which I know for those who know me, I do that all the time. You know, I always look at the mirror because I always want to look my best. Um, yeah, it wasn't that funny. Uh, no, I had this realization. I, I saw this uh, photograph um, and I, was, uh, I didn't bring it with me because I really just, I didn't want to. Um, but this photograph, I will show it to you if you really are desperate to see it. I'll bring it next week. But um, I realized that um, I am really, really lucky my wife even looked at me once. Um, like I saw a picture of me when I was in college and I'm like, man, you look weird. You just look odd. You look scruffy than you do now. Um, you didn't have a beard, so you looked like you were 10. Um, I mean, it's just, it was just amazing. I had this realization all of a sudden that was like, whoa, I actually, I actually did pretty well. I did really good. I did really good. And sorry. Uh, <laughs> I am 6'5'2". <laughs> well, I have one thing going for me, yes. Um, but I had this realization uh, all of a sudden that God does things that are completely strange and are completely out of the realms of my understanding. And I had this realization of, wow, God, just at that moment, as I took a step back, as I stood in my bedroom and I thought, man, 14 years ago, 16 years ago, um, when I was in England, I'd never ever thought that I'd be in this place at this moment right now. And as you think about those things, you think even in your own life about the amazing things, the amazing experiences that you've had with God. Some of them you haven't always been able to explain and some of them maybe even right now that you're trying still to explain of why things happen. As we look here at uh, the fifth chapter of Daniel, uh, for those who know the story, you know where we're going with this. But this idea that sometimes God shows up in the midst of an unusual circumstance and situation and does something out of the ordinary. Something that is so strange so odd, almost like a fire alarm going off twice during the middle of service. Uh, Jeff and I's worst nightmare. Um, how are we going to get that thing down? Like I'm 6'5", I'm not 15 feet tall. Like how's that going to work? So don't think about it. We do, we do have a plan. So you don't have to spend the next 20 minutes thinking about how that's going to happen. Like don't worry about it. We have a plan. But if you see Jeff run out the back, you know, what, you know it's because an alarm's going off. Look at Daniel chapter 5, if you will. And we're gonna, um, we've got a lot to get through this morning. Uh, so I want to uh, begin here at verse 1 in uh, chapter 5. King Belshazzar uh, gave a great banquet for a thousand of his nobles and drank wine with them. While Belshazzar was drinking his wine, he gave orders to bring in the gold and silver goblets that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken from the temple in Jerusalem so that the king and his nobles, his wives and his concubines might drink from them. So they brought in the gold goblets that had been taken from the temple of God in Jerusalem and the king and his nobles, his wives and his concubines drank from them. As they drank the wine, they praised the gods of gold and silver, of bronze, iron, wood and stone. Here we see this king, I mean he's throwing a party and a pretty decent party at that. I mean, a pretty decent party for the up and coming, those people that he would, he would want to be impressing. And here they're drinking, they're drinking, and Balthazar says, you know what? Let's bring out the best stuff. Let's bring out those goblets of gold and silver that my father has taken from the temple in Jerusalem. So then we can drink. It's not like they didn't have them. Like they were already drinking. They already had everything that they needed. But here, Balthazar is saying, you know what? We're going to take something and we're going to make it even better. 
Where did he take it from? He took it from the temple in Jerusalem. Something that was sacred was now turned into something that wasn't. This is why we begin this morning in this story. And the first challenge I give to you right at the beginning of our time together. We each have been given a life. We have each been created by a creator God. And we have been created and made in something that God wants to say, here, let me show you what I want to do in your life. And as we accept Jesus and the Holy Spirit begins to fill us and we begin to understand what it means to live for Him, are we taking God's Word, something that is holy, and making it unholy? Are we using the call that God has placed upon our lives and the places we are right now and are we taking something that is holy and making it unholy. And we'll see as we go through Daniel here how it applies to us how we, so often we take something that is so sacred. And I'm not just saying, I'm not saying traditions here. I'm not saying things that we should always be doing. What I'm saying is how we live our lives in our discipleship, in our devotions, in our opportunities that the Spirit gives to us to witness for Him. Are we taking that holy moment and are we throwing it away? Or are we honoring that holy moment and sharing the greatest, the greatest thing that we have? And maybe that's a better question. Is Jesus the greatest thing that you have? Is Jesus so important to you that every moment, every holy moment that you have with him is sacred to you? Or is it just, ah, oh, you know, it's been a long day. Ah, oh, you know, I, I know I should do my devotions, but God will forgive me. You know, he knows I've had a long day and he knows I need to, to rest. And, and this is the one I, I love the best. Well, you know, God knows that I need a Sabbath, so I've got to sleep for 24 hours like I know I've got to do. No. Sabbath rest for us is to fellowship with the Lord, to take something that is holy and keep it holy. You notice, though, they don't just drink out of these goblets. They're taking this, this something that is holy and making it unholy. What else do they do? Verse 4, as they drank the wine... They praised the gods of gold and silver, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Something that has been set apart for the God of Israel is now being abused. In the midst of all of this, and, and we, we don't know how long it's been going on, but it's been, probably been going on for a while. So people are starting to get drunk. I'm reading into this, this is not in here. But, but people are probably starting to get drunk in the middle of this. Suddenly, out of the blue, in the middle of nowhere, suddenly the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall near the lampstand in the royal palace. The king watched the hand as it wrote. His face turned pale and he was so frightened that his knees knocked together and his legs gave Wait, as I was reading this, I thought of that uh, like a cartoon. You know what I mean? Like a cartoon. You, you, we've all seen it. You know, the knees knocking together, the face going pale. What's going on? You can, Im you can imagine it. You can understand that the king would be nervous, would be worried, would be concerned. What is going on? What is going on? The fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall near the lampstand in the royal palace. I thought to myself for a second, why, why the lampstand? Why near the lampstand? I believe it's so everyone could see. Like it wasn't somewhere hidden in a corner so that just someone might be able to see it or someone might come across it. No, it was God showing up and saying, you take things that are holy and make them unholy, see what I'm going to do. 
It, it reminds us, I'm sure, of stories that, that we've read in the Old Testament. Even of Noah, where he showed up and said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to create a flood and wipe out everybody. But you be ready. You be ready. Even though you might get laughed at, you might get joked about, you might get ridiculed, you be ready. You be ready for that holy moment. And then the king, what does he do? Verse 7. He defaults to what he knows. He defaults to what is familiar to, to him. The king called out for the enchanters, astrologers, and diviners to be brought and said to these wise men of Babylon, whoever reads this writing and tells me what it means will be clothed in purple and have a gold chain placed around his neck and he will be made the third highest ruler in the kingdom. The one right underneath Belshazzar, the one that has prominence, you'll be made royal if you can figure this out. Because I'm scared and I don't know what it is. You figure it out for me and I will give you everything, almost as much as I have. So he doesn't just default to the people that he knows. He defaults to what is usual for him. Let's just throw some money at it. Let's throw everything possibly physical that I have at this problem that I don't understand. Verse 8. And all the king's wise men came in, but they could not read the writing or tell the king what it meant. So King Belshazzar became even more terrified, and his face grew more pale. His nobles were baffled. Baffled. Confused. Can you just imagine it? Have you ever been there? Have you ever been confused by something? I mean, I've been confused many, many, many times. There have been times where somebody will say something to me, or maybe the first time that me and my wife met, where we were introduced, and I said something. She said, oh, I'm sorry, I have no idea what you just said. <laughs> to which my response was, ah, oh, stupid Americans. But anyway, um, <laughs> oh, that was on tape as well. Ooh, I'm in trouble now. <laughs> Obviously, I didn't mean it. But sometimes we're confused. Sometimes in our lives we're confused. We're confused sometimes because we're not looking in the right place. We're trying to figure out ourselves. God, why would you let this happen? God, I'm confused. I don't understand why. See, the problem is, friends, Things happen in our lives and God just, want to say, just wants to say, let me show you my mouth. Let me show you what it means to love in a way that is honoring. In the midst of all this, the kings, the nobles, everybody else who's confused, notice who are confused, it's the king's wise men. It's the nobles, it's everybody who's there, it's the astrologers and the diviners. All these men are completely confused, and then who shows up? The queen. Lady shows up and says, hang on a minute, king, you've got it all wrong. Who, what, what man has never heard that before? You know what I mean? Like, hey, you, you listen, listen to me, listen to me, I know this guy. I know this guy. Let's read it. Verse 10, the queen, hearing the voices of the king and his nobles, came into the banquet hall. O king, live forever. She said, don't be alarmed. Don't look so pale. There is a man in your kingdom who has the spirit of the holy gods in him. I just want you to make note of that as we go by. Notice how she refers to Daniel. The spirit of the holy gods is in him. Just make note of that. In the time of your father... He is found to have insight and intelligence and wisdom like that of the gods. King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father the king, I say, appointed him chief of the magicians, enchanters, astrologers, and diviners. 
we've seen so much of what Daniel has done, but look how quickly it's forgotten. Look how quickly it's forgotten. He's faithful in everything. But look how quick it is forgotten. In, in, in the matter of just, just a, a couple of decades, it's forgotten. Except for this one lady. Verse 12. This man, Daniel, whom the king called Belshazzar, was found to have a keen mind and knowledge and understanding and also the ability to interpret dreams, explain riddles, and solve difficult problems. Call for Daniel, and he will tell you what the writing means. Friends, living a life of integrity, living a life for the Lord, does not mean going out and spreading, oh, look how great I am. Look how good I am. Look how amazing I am. Because you know what? As soon as we do that, that's a long drop. That's a long fall to come off that pedestal. That pride, that sometimes, come on, let's just all be honest. We all struggle with it. Some in varying degrees. Some of us really struggle in in, in great ways. Others, we have that false humility. Oh, no, 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 I didn't didn't do anything. You did, so so give the credit to God. Pride, something... It's something that all of us at some point struggle with. Yet still here, Daniel, living with integrity, living for the Lord, the word gets around. We all know, don't we? You know the people that you will call in an emergency. We just had a conversation this last week. Uh, my wife and I, uh, she's sitting on the couch. She's like, I, I, I think something's going on with my heart and arm. I'm like, it's fine. Just stand up. I'm sure. Put your arm in the air. Yes, it, it, it works. So anyway, we get to bed that night, and then she's like, if I had a heart attack tonight, who would you call to watch the boys? I'm like, man, this is a cheery conversation before we go to bed. Thanks for that. I was like, uh, I hadn't really thought about it, but, um, you know, Mike and Mel, they're safe. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, thanks for agreeing with that. I appreciate that. Um, uh, so, like, they're close. They would be great. That we get to call them. She's like, oh, okay. She rolls over and goes to sleep. Then I'm laying there going, is she going to have a heart attack? Is she not going to have a heart attack? What, what's going on here? Like, like what's all this about? But to be, to, but just thinking about this idea of, we know the people that we'd call. We know the people who would come at a drop of a hat. We know the people that right away would be, oh yeah, I'll be there, I'll be there, I'll be there. They don't need to say, I didn't need to call Mike and Mel up and say, hey, Mike and Mel, would you mind coming over if my wife has a heart attack? Imagine that phone call. Is she planning on having one? You just know the people. Why? Because they live lives of integrity. They live lives for the Lord. And we just know those things. You know the people. But then also the flip side of that. You know the people you're not going to call. You know the people they're not going to call. They're the people that you've called before and You've been like, oh, do I really have to go? I guess if I have to come over, I'll come. Living lives of integrity that give praise and honor to God is the way that we must live. Lives of humility instead of lives of pride. Verse 13. So Daniel was brought before the king and the king said to him, Are you Daniel, one of the exiles my father the king brought from Judah? I have heard that the spirit of the gods is in you and you have insight, intelligence and understanding and outstanding wisdom. Here's why I wanted you to make note of uh, how the queen uh, described Daniel. The spirit of the holy gods is in him is how she described uh, back in verse 11. But here, the king ignores the holy part. Because why? He's falling back on what he knows. The spirit's, uh, verse 14, I have heard that the spirit of the gods is in you and that you have insight, intelligence and outstanding wisdom. Here's the irony of all this. He's already asked people who he believes has wisdom and understanding from the gods. These diviners, these, these noble, these people in his courts that he thinks are the, 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 the best people he can get. He's already asked those people and they have not a clue. I have heard, verse 14, that the spirit of the gods is in you and that you have insight, intelligence, and outstanding wisdom. 
The wise men and enchanters were brought before me to read this writing and tell me what it means, but they could not explain it. Now I have heard that you are able to give interpretations and to, insult and to solve difficult problems. If you can read this writing and tell me what it means, you will be clothed in purple and have a gold chain placed around your neck and you will be made the third highest ruler in the kingdom. This is all what the king is saying to Daniel. There's multiple questions in here and multiple opportunities for Daniel to respond. But the only time he responds is right here in verse 17. Then Daniel answered the king. He could have said, yes, I am he. I am the one. I am the most amazing. I am the wisest. I am the one that you say. And so now let me figure this out. Look at his response. Then Daniel answered the king. You may keep your gifts for yourself and give your rewards to someone else. Nevertheless, I will read the writing for the king and tell him what it means. He lived with integrity and he lived with respect for the king, but still giving honor to God. He knew where it had come from and he knew who to give it back to. He knew that all of this wisdom, all of this understanding, everything that he had, had come from God. He didn't need all this other stuff, this purple robes and the finery and the position. He just wanted to live a life for the Lord. Here's what it meant, verse 18. O king, the most high God, gave your father Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar sovereignty and greatness and glory and splendor. Because of the high position he gave him, all the those he wanted to spare, he spared. Those he wanted to promote, he promoted. And those he wanted to humble, he humbled. All of this, Daniel says, came from who? The most high God. But then notice what happens, verse 20. But when his heart became arrogant and hardened with pride, he was disposed from his royal throne and stripped of his glory. He was driven away from the people he was driven away from people and given the mind of an animal. He lived with the wild donkeys and ate grass like cattle and his body was drenched with the dew of heaven until he acknowledged that the most high God is sovereign over the kingdoms of men and sets over them anyone he wishes. But you, his son, O Belshazzar, have not humbled yourself, although you knew all this. Instead, you have set yourself up against the Lord of heaven you had the goblets from his temple brought to you and you and your nobles, your wives and your concubines drank from them. You praised the gods of silver and gold, of bronze, iron, wood and stone, which cannot see or hear or understand. But you did not honor the God who holds in his hand your life and all your ways. Therefore, he sent the hand that wrote the inscription. Here, three charges. Three charges here we have against uh, Belshazzar. In 22, O Belshazzar, have not humbled yourself. Here's the kicker. Although you knew everything else, you knew what had come before. Instead, number two, you set yourself up against the Lord of heaven. You had the goblets from his temple brought to you and you and your nobles, your wives, your concubines drank from them. Took something that was holy and made it unholy. Number three, you praise the gods of silver and gold, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which cannot see or understand or hear or understand. Here are three things. But, that's the part I think is the most interesting. It's not because of all this, this is, this is what has, has come, but above all of that, you did not honor the God who holds in his hand your life and all your ways. Friends, how are we honoring God today with our lives? Maybe I should ask it a different way. Are we honoring God with our lives today? In the decisions that we make? In the people that we hang out with? In the things that we listen to? In the things that we look at? Forget, forget, would you do that when your mother's in the room? Would you do that if God was sitting in the room with you? 
the one who holds your life in his hands. And not just your life, all your ways. This is the inscription that was written. My Aramaic is not as good as it used to be. Actually, it's never been very good. So I'm just telling you. Uh, I listened to, uh, I don't know whether you ever do this, um, but I, uh, I, went on, I went online to the blueletterbible.com. It's a great resource. Um, and I like listened to the, um, the guy on there and I kept pushing the, the speaking thing just to see how it said and I still couldn't get it. But anyway, this is my best. Mene, mene, tekel, paresi. It's as good as it's going to be. This is what it means. This is what it means. As my, as my good friend Major would say, what is the point? This is the point of these four words. Mene. God, mene means numbered. God has numbered the days of your reign and bore it to an end. We'll come back to that one in a minute because the irony of that is not lost on us as we go in two or three verses. God has numbered the days of your reign and bore it to an end. Tekel, which means weighed. You have been weighed on the scales and found wanting. You have been weighed on the scales. What scales? Here's the standard, friends. These are the scales. This is the standard that you're being weighed against. Not my standard, God's standard. If it was my standard, you'd all go away over the top. Perez, your kingdom is divided. That's what it means, divided. Perez means divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Now here's the thing. Each one of these, each one of these, and you also notice that Mene happens twice. It's like your days are numbered. They're very numbered. <laughs> That's what I think that is. It's, you're, it's not just that your days are numbered. It's they're coming to an end very, very, very quickly. And we'll see that in verse 30, that very night. Belshazzar, king of the Babylonians, was slain. That very night. I'm sure when he heard that, he was like, well, I can go. I've got plenty of time. I can get my affairs in order. I know they're numbered, but... You know, I've got, I must have a little bit of time. No, that's it. Boom, done, finished. The God who holds a hand, his life in his hands that very night. But here, these three responses relate to the three charges that were held against him. Here, you have not humbled yourself. You have not lived a life of humility. Therefore, in that third response here, your kingdom will be divided. Everything that you have lived for will be divided, will be removed from you. You have been weighed and found wanting. Your moral compass has been found wanting. You had plenty of vessels to drink from, but you had to defile what was sacred. Your morals are out of line. And then Mene, God has numbered the days of your reign. You've worshipped every other God. But you've missed the sovereign God. God has numbered your days. That sovereign God who holds your life and your ways in his hand. He has numbered those. But in between verse 28 and verse 30, where Belshazzar disappears from the face of the earth because he was slain, what do we have? We see it again. Belshazzar doesn't go, oh, woe is me. I'm going to drop on my knees and worship the sovereign God. Now, what does he say? He falls back to his default. Then at Belshazzar's command, with no remorse, uh, not seeking any forgiveness. At his command, Daniel was clothed in a pup with purple. A gold chain was placed around his neck and he was proclaimed the third highest ruler in the kingdom. Two things. Daniel didn't want any of this. But God honored Daniel's faithfulness.
that very night, Belshazzar, king of the Babylonians, was slain, and Darius the Mede took over the kingdom at the age of 62. Turn with me, if you will, to a very familiar passage, a very familiar verse, Micah, chapter 6. With no remorse, no forgiveness sought, Belshazzar's life was ended. Just like that. Done. Micah chapter 6 verse 8. This is where we're going to end our, our, our morning this morning. Micah chapter 6 verse 8. He has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. To act justly, to live with fairness and respect for others, with our moral compass pointing forward. To have mercy, to love mercy. Think about what it means to have compassion and forgiveness. And then walking in humility. Walking in humility before the Lord with modesty and meekness. Less of myself and more of God. There's a whole sermon in itself there and we're not going to take the next hour to do that either because it's a different Sunday. But what I want us to think about and understand as we look at the life and, and, and the, the comparison between Daniel and the king we see Daniel who lives a life of integrity, of selflessness, of saying, God, whatever your will is, that's what I want to do. I want to give all glory to you. And then we see Belshazzar, who wants everything for himself, and his desire is for him to look good. As I looked in the mirror last night as I looked at that picture as I had studied this scripture over the last few weeks I had to take a secondary look because it wasn't about what was on the outside it wasn't about what I saw it's the things that I remember about the times when we first met. The same needs to be with the Lord. You see, the problem is, friends, when we first find and know Jesus, when we see these junior soldiers come in and we hear about them and we had an opportunity at the back to pray with them and they're high-fiving and they're so excited about becoming junior soldiers and getting enrolled this morning and standing before you all, they were so excited about the fact that what? One, they belonged to a family and number two they love Jesus and you could visibly see it and they weren't concerned about oh well I hope I walk down properly and I hope I stand here properly because yeah, I'm sure you all saw my son oh where's my, where's my promise I don't even know where it is uh, let's pick my nose let's... he doesn't care he's just excited about knowing who Jesus is all of them, every single one. The one I loved best was over here. I think it was Caden and Charlotte were standing next to each other. And I don't know whether you saw, but as Caden got up, he stood here. And then what did Charlotte do? Just kind of moved him over. Like, this is your spot. This is where you are. Look, I almost tripped over the holiness table. Think about it. Friends, when we get older, we get boring. We don't get excited about Jesus anymore. Fair enough. Most of us don't get excited about Jesus anymore. And here's what I mean. Here's what I mean. Here's what I mean. The problem is, friends, some of us, we live our lives looking for those God moments. And when those God moments come along, we jump at it. And we go, yes, 
Thank you, God, for giving me that opportunity. And then there's some of us, when those God moments come along, we go, ah, I hope I have the right words to say. And then for most of us, the moments in between are the moments that we sometimes get wrong. They're the moments that sometimes we're not always excited about who Jesus is and what he's doing in our lives, especially in those moments of forming and molding and shaping and challenging. Those moments that as Daniel was brought before the king, well, what's going on now? What's happening? What's taking place? Am I ready to serve the Most High with integrity? So I challenge you with this morning, as you look at your life, as you look at your workplace, as you look at your family, and we all come from different spaces, different experiences, but the one thing that is constant for all of us is God's standard. And friends, God is not going to lower his standard for you. And he's not going to lower his standard for me. And if you want God to do that, then you're looking in the wrong places. Because it's all about you then. Friends, God, God loves us so much that he wouldn't even stop his son from coming. He wouldn't even keep that to himself. He wouldn't even hold that back. I've been reading a book that I've been very challenged by. And this is the challenge I'm going to give to you. And you're probably going to hear this at least now and probably at Easter as well. And here's what it is. The blood of Christ was spilled for us a long, long time ago. But here's where the rubber hits the road. Are you prepared to be crucified with Christ each and every day? The blood was spilt once. It had to be Jesus. Our responsibility? To say, Christ, I crucify my life with you. I choose to pick up my cross. Can you say that this morning? Can you say, Lord, with all humbleness, with all the integrity that I have, with all the passion that I have, once again, I'm prepared to crucify myself with you. I'm prepared to pick up my cross. There's a chorus that we sing. And I think it's very apt for us as we respond this morning. Because I believe before we pick up the cross, what do we have to do? You know, we all, we all have probably been through it in work training or something. The first thing that we have to do when we properly pick something up is bend your knees. And friends, it applies to our Christian lives. To bow the knee before Christ. To come before him and say, here I am. At thy feet I bow adoring, bending lower, lower still, giving up my all to follow, just to do my master's will. When I moved to this country, was I necessarily thinking about doing the master's will? Absolutely not. I was following a girl. Fortunately, that worked out. <laughs> but when we start to think about what that means in everyday life, giving up my all, giving up my pride, giving up my issues, which let's be honest, we all have them, giving up everything I am, everything you are to follow, just to do the master's will. Maybe you want to come and you want to kneel this morning, to physically come and kneel before the Lord, to say, Lord, I'm kneeling, adoring you, as once again, 
I choose to pick up my cross as I once again choose to sacrifice who I am on the cross with you. As we sing this chorus a couple of times, I want to invite you to come to kneel, maybe even stand at our holiness table, to come and bow adoring before the sovereign Lord.